I want to start with Jessica, who has some ideas to share with her, us on her Logic Games approach. So Jessica, I want to give you the floor. I'll share your link if you'd like, and we'll get into it. All right, perfect. Um, I'll also put in, let me see. Um, so that's the link to the Logic Game that I'm going to be doing. It's um, Steve's um, monkey seating arrangement uh, game. And so I'll pull that one up. And um, Steve, what do you think? Should I let them look at it real quick and like try to graph it or should I just wait? What do you think? Yeah, why don't you give them a, a couple minutes, like maybe three or four minutes just to do the setup for the game. I think it might take too long to do all the questions associated, but I think if you let them do the setup, then show them your diagram and walk them through a little bit of the inference making process that could be useful. So if you okay. wanna give everyone like three or four minutes. Alrighty. Uh, which game? Um, I sent it in the chat. It's um, Steve's monkey ordering linear game. All right. Does everyone feel like they were able to look at it real quickly? Um, all right. So going through it, I think the best thing that I can say about logic games is um, redoing games has been probably the biggest thing that has helped me the most. Um, you'd be surprised redoing games really does help you make deductions, see things that I didn't see the first time. Um, so going through this game, this is how um, I diagrammed it. Um, but going first, of course, whenever I was reading it, I saw that ease, um, as you can see, my first one, ease window never faces the sun. So automatically, ease always going to be a moon. And then, but D's window always faces the sun. All right. So D's and uh, S. And I like to put it like smaller to the side so that I know where I'm going to be putting them. And then um, I automatically saw F sits in row one or two but neither two nor three can contain D. So I just wrote ahead, um, F is one or two, not three or four, just so I can see it a little bit better. And then, so I knew that neither row no, two nor three can contain D. So automatically I put um, one or four and you see that I crossed it out. So that's a deduction that I made later on. Um, B sits in the row immediately behind D's row. So that's how I was able to make the deduction that um, D is never going to be in row four because B has to be behind um, D. So that means D is always going to be in one. And since D is always in sun, uh, in the sun window, I automatically was able to put it in my graph. Um, so that's a huge deduction that, you know, if I was reading too quickly and I didn't put those together, I would have missed that. Um, and then if B's window faces the sun, A's window faces the moon. If D sits in row one, then G sits in row four. That's another deduction right there. I knew that obviously D's always gonna be in one. That means G is always gonna be in four. Um, so with B and with G, um, it doesn't say that they have to be sun, they have to be um, moon. So I left them kind of open. And then if B sits in the same row as F, then G's window faces the sun. So I put BF and I put a little umbrella just to remind myself that it can be FB, BF, doesn't matter. Um, then G's window faces the sun. So does anyone have any questions about how I did it? They're not seeing something. They didn't make the deduction, anything like that. I just want to call out, Jessica, how clean this is. This is so well- <laughs> organized, I feel like you could look back at this a year from now and you would be able to interpret exactly what happened here. I've gotten questions about how to diagram it, how to keep it looking clean, how to organize the question diagrams that Jessica is labeled in the second version, yes. original versus question. So, so these, these are all local diagrams. And so you can see that the exact roadmap of how she went about the game. And so that way, Jessica, you could look back at your previous work if you wanted to be a bit more efficient. And so I can imagine like you could even draw grids separating like main diagram from Q1 and Q3 from the rules on the right. This is all hap the, what you wrote in the blue pen, I'm assuming is happening for you mentally yes. on the page. Like you know where everything is. You don't need to label it for, label it to your, for yourself personally, but mentally it's there. So it's comprehensible to you even if other folks might not know 
what was for Q3 or Q5 versus the main diagram, but you're not simply drawing on the main diagram itself. You're doing the work separately. Um, yeah. So throughout my logic games and things like that, I kind of just figured out that for me, I have seen that some people do touch their original diagram, but when I touched my original diagram, I would then kind of mess myself up. Um, and I know that some people, whenever they see my diagrams and stuff, they're like, how do you have the time? I'm telling you, it's just redoing it. You'll learn, okay, let me diagram this one. Let me not diagram this one. And, but yeah, keeping it clean and like keeping my rules in this area, my original diagram here, and then everything else is just kind of my work. I feel like staying structured and organized has been a huge, huge um, help in going through the questions fast and as easily as possible. Um, but yeah, um, so, okay, I, I think we don't have any questions. So I think, um, I don't know how much time we have, but I just wanna talk real quickly about question one. Um, so with the LSAT flex, obviously, um, if y'all start looking through it and things like that, it's not like the paper version. You only see one question at a time and then I'll see the rules and everything like that. Um, one thing that I found that I don't think enough people do is so with question number one, um, go through it, you know, boom, boom, bam. I'll tell you what the, I have the correct answer, obviously, cause I did it. Um, so I found out which one was the correct answer and every single time, no matter what the game is, anything, I will write the correct answer. As you can see on, um, the screen question one, I put down the correct answer. I put one D E blue, uh, B E blah, 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 because I can't tell you how many times you think to yourself like, oh, I don't have the time to, why do I need to? Because there's so many questions that are going to be like, if F was in moon and in row one, what's going to happen? Blah, 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 blah. I don't even have to spend time on it because I already wrote it out. I know that this works. So you might as well write it out. Take a couple, five seconds more to write it out because on my, um, as I went through the questions, question four, question question four, question five, and question six, I was all able to go back to my first reference of question one and that diagram. And I was able to, some, yes, you still have to do a little bit of work. And that's why I have other diagrams, but you'd be surprised how many times I go back to that first one. So I think that's so, so important and not enough people do it, but um, yeah. Nice, yeah, so the correct answer to the orientation question you're writing it out separately on the page and that's helping you better refer back to it when you need to, maximizing use of all the work you've done up to that point. Yes, so, because I just feel like um, not enough people realize that every diagram, like some people when they're done, they like quickly cross it out so that they stop worrying about that one keep all of your work open because you never know what the next question is going to be. It could be direct reference to the other diagram that you already did. So save your time and don't, you know, go ahead and, oh my gosh, like cross, 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 try your best to just, you know, stay cool, stay calm and try your best to keep everything as organized as possible and just go from there. Um, and also when you're going through the questions, I feel like so many people, they, you know, they go into it and they're like, okay, question one, um, does that work? And then they work it out. You don't have enough time. You have to go through, look through all of them really quickly. Oh, obviously B and C that happened in question one. So that's definitely not going to be it. Oh, well D that violates this said rule. Um, and you can really save a lot of time. And even if, you know, you have to end up still diagramming two, it's way better than diagramming four or five, you know? Um, so I don't know, do we have enough time to go through the questions, at least one or two, or does anyone want to go through a specific question that they just don't really understand? Do you want to talk a little about this third image you sent me where you're kind of summarizing your thought process for each choice? Yeah. So I just, um, I don't do this on test day or anything like that, but, um, explaining it to y'all, if anyone had like a question on like, why they didn't understand one was right, one was wrong. Um, 
So I just went through and I told myself like, kind of like my process of elimination on why I took away every single one. And um, so the first one you can see, I went through, I crossed out all of them and I wrote out, this one's wrong because obviously if B is an S, A is an M and in this diagram, it's not. Um, and then in uh, question two, I automatically saw, well, C can, A can, G can. And so I just really like to make sure that I, when I'm crossing something out, I'm telling myself, no, this can't be it because obviously this. Um, because I feel like sometimes we may just, especially with those could be true and must be true, those can really, really get you because, you know, if it's a must be true and I'm looking at my diagram and I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 F can be an M. Okay, yes, it could but it doesn't have to be true every single time. So you have to be so, so careful um, just to make sure that you're not overlooking any steps, things like that. So I felt like going through, um, especially when I was learning how to do logic games, how it best worked, uh, how it would work best for me, I really made sure to always make sure with myself, like, okay, this one's definitely wrong because of this or because of that. Um, yeah, so that's that's pretty much what, this picture is is each question and why I I took out everything. Nice, fantastic. I see. Just I see. Uh, Michelle has a question on could be true. So Michelle, you want to share more? Yeah, thanks. So, have you found like on a this could be true question? Do you just try and like plug in the opposite for the ones that? Does that make sense? Uh, like if it says, I I mean I can't think of an example. Oh, like you just mean in general, like could be true question. Yeah, yeah. Just in general, do you just like try the opposite or try a different option? And and if that works, then then you know that that's the one. No. So usually the way that I approach could be trues is um like question five in a way or in uh, diagram five for question five of how I had it. Um, you can kind of see that I have like. I put down everything that was necessary. Like if it tells you if D is in S or if uh, F is in whatever, I'll diagram that. And then anything that I know that they can kind of just be wherever, I leave them more to the side and I'll put like C comma E comma H and I'll just tell myself like, okay, these can all go anywhere. Um, and I feel like that's the best way that I've come to find to do those. Um, or in some cases, if it's like, if D has to be in the first row or something like that, and there's two diagrams, I'll diagram the two and I'll do all of the plugins that I can do on both. And then usually with the must be trues, um, it will be true in, well, not usually, every single time in the must be trues, it'll be true for both diagrams. If you're only seeing it in one diagram and you're not seeing it in the other one that you did, it's definitely not going to be the answer. Um, but with the could be trues, if it's like C could be first and you see through, okay, it could be. Um, and most of the time with those, I can usually take out a good three of them just because of rules. It violates some rule. Like it'll be like, oh, D can be in row four and it's like no it can't it can only be in in one so I think that's honestly like a timing thing like with time you'll start to see like the common things to catch I hope that makes sense yeah thank you I'll just add one little thing on that which is basically yeah it takes practice to see what exactly is it that you're looking for with a could versus a must versus a cannot and so Jessica's really neatly laid out here her evaluation of each choice and what happens with it I'm looking at for example choice uh question three it does it could it does it could and then d is obviously different in some way Cho question five possible versus never versus maybe something else like a must and so regardless she's seeing what is the truth value of a given choice does b ever appear on slot one versus does it always appear on slot one versus can i find at least one case where it didn't so knowing what you're looking for, and then drawing a comprehensive set of the possibilities or using previous work, all of those things can come into play and you'll see it as you do more and more logic games. And so of course, also use my video explanations where I walk through tons of them evaluating every single question.
One question here from Eloise about can versus could. You want to share anything on that, Jessica? Um, personally, should can be true and could be true be approached in a similar way? I approach them in the same way. Um, I've only really found um, the can and could versus the must. Um, but I don't know, maybe Steve, you, you can correct me on that if I'm wrong. No, you're right. Yeah, there's no, there's no difference there. And I think generally, just based on LSAC's tone, they tend to use the word could. I don't see as many cans in logic games, but I wouldn't think there'd be any difference there because either one is simply opening up the possibility, asking, has, is there, in all, out of all the sets of possibilities, can we, do we ever have it occur at least once? If we have it occur at least once, then we know that it can be true and we've seen it, so we know that it's a possibility. We know that it could occur because they're all hypothetical. The question is, what are out of all the different ways that the variables could be lay out, laid out? There could be one in a thousand where it occurs. Therefore, you know it could happen. And it's a possibility that it will end up that way. Like the clowns will get out of the car in that order in one possibility out of a thousand. Well, well done, well done, Jessica. And thank you so much for sharing your, your walkthrough here. I've shared the link to the Google Doc with your photos in the chat for those who want to save a copy, but I think this is just a great example of how efficient and clean you can make your diagrams. And I'm, I'm sure it's been helping you a lot, as you said. So thanks again, Jessica.